Hello folks, welcome to another episode of the TFC Audio Project. In this episode of Shop Talk, Mike and I have a conversation about hip dysfunction. It's a massive issue we see every day in clinic, and few people realize that flat feet mostly come from hips that don't move properly. We chat about why our hips get so stiff, issues that it can cause downstream, and how you can start getting your hips moving again. This episode is sponsored by our travel partner, Nanook Protective Hard Cases, which we use to transport gear for our seminars and workshops, uh, and you can check out their awesome cases at nanook.com. This Shop Talk episode is also sponsored by tfcshop.com, your online store for footwear that lets your feet function like they're supposed to, with styles from awesome brands like Vibram, Vivo Barefoot, Shamus Sandals, and more. Uh, We also sell balance beams at tfc-shop.com, and each TFC balance beam comes with access to our movement database of progressively more difficult movements so you can restore your hip stability, starting with something as easy as balancing on one leg and working up to a lot more complex challenges. um, It helps to tune your balance, which opens up the hips, opens up the ankles, and can give you access to more strengths with your lifts and even better technique with running when you have more stable hips. Uh, That's it for sponsors, so let's get into it. It's the T. FC Audio Project. It's a collective effort. Help people understand their bodies, starting at the feet are the gateway for people to see that there's an issue. You know, a foot conversation is always a whole body conversation. Hey everyone, Nick and Mike here uh, for another episode of Shop Talk. Today we're going to talk about hip dysfunction um, and more specifically how tight hips cause flat feet. So, you know, it's a problem. Hip, hip issues or hip dysfunction is a big problem that we see in our clinic. Virtually everything from the belly button down that we treat has at its root cause, um, I'd say 95% plus of the time uh, being hip dysfunction. So we're going to chat about that, talk about a few things. One is we're just going to define the problem. We're talking about how um, how we treat hip dysfunction, how we look at it, kind of debunk a few myths, specifically, you know, um, your glutes aren't firing. That's a big one. And kind of just explain the way that we look at it um, and how we see the hip as a major player. So, uh, so let's get right into it. I think probably the first part is let's talk about, let's like identify the problem. Um, and the problem is that people's hips lock up from spending too much time in a static position, i.e. sitting in chairs, which puts their hip in flexion and neutral rotation. So when you spend all day in that position, your body gets really good at being there and not very good at being in other positions. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I think we first got to talk about I mean, the hips are very important. They're almost like engines for our lower body. The so primary engine, yeah, should be. They should be the primary engine. So they are doing a lot of work for propelling us forward as we walk, stabilizing, stabilizing us when we're on our feet, mm-hmm. when we're balancing on stuff, when we're on one leg. Um, they're really important kind of linchpin body parts for our human movement. Yeah. So I think you mentioned why, what is the root of the dysfunction? Well, the big thing is that uh, immobility, I would say, is yep. one of the biggest things. I agree, which um, results in the muscles. You know, if the joint can't move, the muscles don't know to fire. Um, you start to overuse other areas, right? Like if you can't use your hips to walk around with, you're still going to move around and walk. And a lot of people are still squatting, lunging, running, all that kind of stuff. So if you can't use your hips, that workload has to be shipped off somewhere else, right? Yeah. So, I mean, and if you look at what the hips are, let's get into anatomy a little bit. They're they're ball and socket joints. So mm-hmm. just like the shoulder, very mobile, or they have the potential to be very mobile. They're mm-hmm. not quite as mobile as the shoulder because the, the socket on the hip is a lot deeper, right? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the shoulder is, is a lot shallower. So you have even more mobility. And what you what you gain from mobility, you give up in a little bit of stability. So you have mm-hmm. to work extra hard. So that interplay of mobility and stability around the, the hip and shoulder are very important. Mm-hmm. But like we always talk about in our courses, the hardware software thing is very, the interplay of the hardware and software is huge. So when Mm -hmm. we're talking about mobility, we're talking about do your hips move like they should. Um, So your hips, basically ball and saga means you can move them in millions of different planes of motion, your unlimited planes of motion, right? Now we talk in an anatomy book about flexion, extension, rotation. I guess millions of different movements in the three planes of motion. Potential different, potential combinations of all the different uh, movements of the hip. Whereas, and again, every joint has different physiological movements, but the hips just can combine it all. And you see this when you're on a balance beam and you're making all these little movements Mm -hmm. in your hip joint, try to make these fine tune adjustments to keep your body stacked. Mm -hmm. So a lot of mobility needs to happen at the hip. And I think Mm -hmm. that the lack of mobility that we see today is, is one of the, the root causes of a lot of the dysfunction. So, um, what would you say? I, I would say that, you know, it all of ranges of the hip are important, but I think I see a lot of extension 
lacking? I think that's the biggest deficit that we, that you see. And I mean, it makes perfect sense when you look at the, you know, what do we all overdose on? It's the sitting position in a chair. So when you're in a chair, your hip is in flexion and it's in neutral rotation. Uh, and that seems to be the place where, you know, the number one range of motion that I think gets lost that's the most crucial is lack of extension. If you mm-hmm. can't extend your hip and get your hip behind you, um, two things happen. One, you start to lose access to a lot of those important posterior chain or posterior hip muscles, um, you know, namely the glutes, but also all these little fine tuning muscles deep in the hip that stabilize the hip. You start to lose access to those. And rotation is another one, right? Rotation is needed. If you want to go into a squat and be able to ha- put your you know, align your knees in a position that allows you to be stable and continue to generate torque through the squat. You have to be able to externally rotate your hips. If you can't do that, you start to lose the ability to use your hips as a primary um, force driver or stabilizer in the squat. And so you have to use your quads a lot more, which is why we see everyone being so quad dominant. Everyone's knees are kind of, you know, the cartilage under their kneecaps is grinding away because their knees are doing the job of their hips and their knees. Mm -hmm. And, And the job of the hips is a big job. Um, and then we do have to talk about, I mean, I would say like, if you, if you rank them, I think hip extension is very important because it just that like to walk, you need a good amount of hip extension. So Mm -hmm. like human physiological hip extension to walk sustainably. Um, but then like you say, rotation abduction is a big one too. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're sitting in a chair, you're kind of in this one specific position, you're kind of like neutralist rotation. You're in a about 90 degrees flexion, Mm -hmm. give or take, um, you're in about neutral abduction too. So I think a big problem is that you, when you're sitting, you're actually holding yourself in the sitting position. You're not just being held there too. So you're actually using muscle tension to hold you there. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I noticed too. It's like, it's like the sitting on the bus effect. You Mm -hmm. don't want to just like splay your legs out and hit the people beside you. (laughs) So there's some sort of tension you need to hold. If you're in an office chair, it's the same thing. You don't want to just like let your legs go. You have to hold tension. So it's not just yet you're in a position, you're holding tension there and that's producing all this tone a lot of groin tone, um, a lot of hip flexor tone, just holding you in that chair position. Well, think of think of women wearing a skirt. Obviously, you don't want to splay your legs. You know, yeah. you don't want to be spread eagle in the office or on the bus. So, so yeah, you're right. You're you're actively contracting your groin muscles to prevent your legs from flopping out to the side. So, not only are you putting your body in this fixed position, you're actually holding tension to hold yourself in that position, which is exactly. why people's bodies really like to be there, and they lose the ability to. You know, part of the inability, I think, to drive the knees out in the squat, which is, you know, in theory, it's a, it's a good cue, right? It works for a lot of people. It's not great for everyone. So before everyone freaks out about the knee out cue, it, it, it works, right, um, for a lot of people. But I think the inability to be able to get the knees out and, and open up some space in that hip socket comes from, one, not only the lack of ability to rotate the hip. If your hips have never been exposed to rotation on a day-to-day basis, how can you expect them to do that when you're under load or doing like a squat pattern? But number two, it's not only the inability to rotate the actual hip joint itself, but I think there's so much tone gathered up in those adductor muscles that, you know, we see it all the time. People are weak laterally in their stabilizers. People are tight medially in their groin muscles. Um, and it's, like so that, it, it's just like this roadblock. People can't get in a good position because their bodies are so adapted and so comfortable uh, and set in that in that chair sitting position. It's crazy. That's it. And if, if they're... If you're holding tension in that position, theoretically, you're becoming more stable in that position. So you're developing stability in, to be frank, an undesirable position. Mm-hmm. Because if you're, and that's the common position, and it's something that we, there's the term sitting is the new smoking, but it's just, sitting is just so, like, we, we consider it so normal. Mm-hmm. It's like, have a seat. Do you want to have a seat? Like, and if it's almost, it's weird when you're at, at like a, you'll be at uh, a party or something or at a dinner <laughs> and people are like, have a, have a seat. And you'll be like, well, no, I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather stand right yeah, now. Yeah, you look like a weirdo. And then they're <laughs> like, get, we get that all the time. They think you're a weirdo. Um, even if you're just standing there having a drink or something and, and they'll like pull a chair up to you, like have a seat. Yeah. Right? And it's like, so it's just so ingrained that we should be sitting and, and we should be, and that's the comfort position. And it's yeah. like, almost like, you know. I don't know where that came from, but it, it's almost like that's where um, we should we should be, and that's like it's almost to be a good guest. You want to have somebody sit. Um, no, you sit at that. work. It's you sit. It's weird, and it's one. It's it's hilarious because the people that try and um, they almost feel like they're being bad hosts by not giving you a chair, but you give them the first like you know I'm okay. I, I actually prefer to stand, and they kind of look at you weird, and that's the same person where. At some point in the conversation that evening, they're going to be like, oh, fuck, my back really hurts or my knees hurt. What do I do for this? It's like, oh, exactly. one, start by doing what I'm doing and not sit as much. And I think an asterisk has to be put beside sitting because, you know, not all sitting is created equal, right? We talked about this in our um, seminar at TFC is like, 
if you sit on the floor and you put your hips in these different positions, 90-90, kneeling down, whatever it is, that's different than sitting in a chair, right? That is a fundamentally different position that you're putting your hips in. You can actually yeah. use sitting to work on your hip mobility, but you can't be you can't do that when you're sitting in a chair. In a chair, the chair is the problem. And and so sitting on the ground is almost like you're. It's just it's a di- dynamic process. Where yep. sitting in a chair is more of a static process. You can shift your butt cheeks side to side a little bit mm-hmm. when they get sore, but. Again, sitting on the ground, such a better option for people. Mm-hmm. Even if you spend a component of, of time each night, like let's say you're watching Netflix for an hour, mm-hmm. sit on the ground. Like that's a great option. Yeah, get rid of your couch. <laughs> and I, I was talking to a patient yesterday in the clinic and I was like, we should, we need to reframe because we were, we were having the stand up desk conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy's just super, super stiff in his hips, but I was like, we need to kind of reframe what sitting is and Right now, it's like, because he, he was very quick to tell me, oh, but don't worry, I get up every hour to take a break from the sitting and I walk around or whatever. Yeah, that's a joke. You so, get up for 30 friggin' seconds no, exactly. and you sit for, you know, 58 minutes and 30, 59 minutes and 30 seconds. That doesn't count, bud. No, exactly. So what I said to him was, let's let's just reverse the logic on that. So so you're saying that your your go-to position is sitting and then your your position your resting position is getting up. Like in order to take a break from the sitting, mm-hmm. you're getting up from your chair. And yeah. so so I I said, okay, well what sitting should be is the resting position yeah. from something else. And that's really fundamentally what it is. If you're doing work all day, if you're walking around all that, it's nice to have a seat. That yeah. is the resting position. Should be a treat. To, it's a treat. It's like a relaxation <laughs> point. It's not something you adopt as your everyday default position. Exactly. <laughs> but now it's like a treat to stand. He's like, oh I get to stand once, you know, for a minute every hour yeah so it's super super weird that we look at like standing being on our feet as this thing that um, we do to actually just give ourselves a break from the sitting position now it's mm-hmm. just flipped on its head so i think looking at it that way and he's going to be going to get a stand-up desk because he says he has the option but um and again stand-up desks they need all it allows you to be is i think the big thing with that is more dynamic you're yep. at least not and more variety in your more variety that you can adopt yeah. So again, it's never good to be static in one specific position for too long. I don't expect people to stand, you know, to feet side by side for three hours straight. That's not yeah. natural, but moving around a little bit more, put propping your leg up, getting your hips out of that stuck, that, that specific sitting position mm-hmm. where I think people get stuck in too often. And I think another thing is driving. Like I drove to and from Toronto on the weekend and, and specifically my right side, because I'm holding tension more on that side Mm, because i'm pressing the gas and releasing the gas and i was noticing even my ankle from that like press the gas release the grass i was Mm -hmm. holding ankle tension like the entire Mm -hmm. four hours i was in the car true so i was like crap that's probably why why my ankle's a lot stiffer on this or or one component of it yep so people who drive a lot um you go on long drives people who drive for a living Mm -hmm. um these are some things too uh that can things can get really out of whack when we're sitting there yeah. So, okay. So the problem is people's hips lock up because we spend too much time in one fixed position and our body, your body is literally just a reflection of what you do with it. If all you do with it all the time is sit in a chair, you know, like, uh, I think at that perform better summit, Greg Rose talked about like an average routine for people. You wake up in the morning, you sit down at a chair for breakfast. You sit down on a couch to watch sports. You sit down in a car to drive to work. You get to work. You sit down in a chair for three hours. Maybe you get up a few times, but the bulk of the time is sitting. Um, at lunch, you may go for a walk, but then you sit down for lunch, you sit down at work again, you sit in your car, you go sit for dinner, you go sit, watch TV, and then you go to bed in a fetal position with your hips bent. Never, ever have you really had to get into hip extension. Um, most of your day is spent in hip flexion. So why would you expect your hips to have to be able to do this mysterious movement that you never actually get them into during the day? It's really, you get really good at, you get better at sitting. So whatever you're doing with your body gets better at doing. So you're, you're becoming a master at sitting. Exactly. And people, that's the problem. it's one of those things where people accumulate so much. It's so, like you said, normal and normal and natural are different things, right? Most people have normal feet. No one has natural feet, which is actually what our feet should look like. So I think we need to, you know, normal doesn't mean it's something you should be doing. It's just something that has been so ingrained that we do it so often. And I think people underestimate how much time they actually spend in, in chairs. It's, it's one of those things you ask people in clinic, Whatever they say, multiply by two, you're probably still under because people just don't think of the sitting that they do. They don't even think of cars as sitting. And if you think of how much time you spend in cars or at meals in the sitting position, like those are, you know, some sitting is not optional. You get, I don't know of a car you can stand in yet, but if you change uh, eating your meals or at the end of the day of watching TV or watching sports or whatever it is to, to adopt a different position, you can actually turn that time, um, take it away from sitting, 
So you're doing less sitting volume, but you can actually turn it into a way to mobilize your hips and counteract mm -hmm. the sitting that you didn't have the option not to do, right? If you have to, if you have to drive to and from work and that's an hour or two hours, you have no option but to do that. So use the optional sitting time to change away from a sitting in a chair or couch position to mobilizing the hips and offsetting the sitting that you had to do. Because um, fundamentally the sitting is just, our main point is that sitting is just robbing your hips of their mobility. Mm -hmm. It's a big player in that. It's the biggest player in that. So, and hips that aren't mobile, a joint that's supposed to be incredibly mobile, are not allow you going to do the, th are not going to allow you to do things with your hips that you would otherwise be allowed to do if you mm -hmm. had all their mobility there. So that could, if you look at what the hips are needed for in different human movement patterns, there's a lot of things that require all these different planes of motion. Mm -hmm. We talk about extension being important because walking is one of the things that, like, you know pretty much everybody walk, needs to walk to and from places. So it's yep. like if we're, if we're missing these key areas of hip range of motion, I mean, that's, that's big. And they're still walking. They're just walking in a very weird way and ingraining a poor pattern that long-term is not sustainable. So if the problem is people's hips lock up from spending too much time sitting, the, what's the solution? And I, I think we share the same mindset that the solution is, number one, help people understand what, you know, the root cause of why their hips get stiff, right? Like so, telling someone, oh, yeah, I got stiff hips. A lot of people just think, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 50 now and my hips are getting stiff. It's like, well, no, like your hips are stiff because of what you're doing with your body during the day. So I think as a baseline, we've got to explain to people, okay, it's sitting in chairs that are stiffening up your hips. So without, if, if all you do is try and open up your hips, you know, this whole thing we talk about protect, correct, develop, protect is get rid of the things, or at least modify the things that are getting you in trouble in the first place. Then you can correct, then you can mobilize your hips and work on regaining your mobility. But if you don't actually get rid of the negatives before you add more stuff, um, it, you know, mobilize your hips for an hour a day. That's great. If you sit for eight hours a day, you're counteracting or you're negating a lot of the work you're doing. So we it's, really got to modify and get people to understand what is causing the problem in the first place, understand how the body works, understand why you're having those problems, and then help guide them and give them strategies to kind of modify that so that they're not having to spend five hours a day mobilizing their hips to counteract all the sitting they did. I think the key is it's a little bit of both because just, I mean, unfortunately, the way society set up these days, you're, there's things that will, uh, we're just society as a whole. We're not able to do the things that, um, that are natural for us anymore from a movement standpoint. So mm -hmm. driving is an example. Like there's times where you need to sit, for example, but the biggest thing is people do need some sort of routine each, each day or, or most days to just, just get your hips into different positions to just move them regardless mm -hmm. of where you're doing. Cause even if you're like, let's say you're standing, like I would argue that you'd still, you're, there's so many different planes of motion that these hips can go into. If you're going on a hike, you're climbing up different sizes of rocks. If you're doing all these different things with your hips, you get into a squat, you're, hip, you're putting your hips in all these positions. So just do something each day to touch you know, most of the ranges of motion of your hips. And it could be very simple. Get in a squat, yeah. expose your hips to extension, do a couple of key mobilizations mm -hmm. on the ground. Um, and that's just like degreasing the hips. It's like, it's like greasing them. And it's like mm -hmm. getting them moving each day. I think that is just, I think it's just a requirement for people, regardless of what they're doing mm -hmm. um, otherwise, because it's just the way it is. I agree. And people, it, it's crazy how many people you talk to or how many patients you talk to and they work to put in so much work, so much time, so much effort into mobilizing a joint. But where they fail is they're not using it every day, right? They mobilize this joint. They put in all this work to mobilize it. And it's really quite easy to maintain. It's once you have the mobility, make sure you use it to a small extent even every day, right? Once you gain the mobility to be able to get into a squat position comfortably, get into a squat position every damn day. Yeah. Right? Like don't, don't just assume it's going to stay there forever when you go back and spend time in chairs again. Like you have to use it. And if you use it, you don't mysteriously wake up one day and lose it. So it, that, that's a big one. It's positions, like, right? Exactly. Adopt, get into these positions every day. Create a habit. You brush your teeth every day. You shower every day. Create a habit of putting your hips into different positions every day and you will not mysteriously lose that hip mobility. And it's really... Knowing that hip dysfunction is kind of this overarching principle behind, you know, why do most people have flat feet? A lot of them is because their hips don't work. So the whole lower leg collapses down, the knee caves in, the knees start doing way more work. So you start to get knee pain, foot problems, collapsed arches, back pain. If your hips are tight at the front, I can guarantee you're at some point going to have issues with your back because it's the exact same mechanism, right? The front of your hip gets tight, your low back get, ends up getting pulled on, you're using your hamstrings, your calf, and your low back to do the work of, of what should be what should be done by your hip extension. 
So it's just all these big compensations and our, our approach right now is, is take care of sick people with this palliative approach, right? And I, I always thought the word palliative was reserved for people with end stage cancer where you're, you're just trying to make them comfortable. But when I looked up the pa- definition of palliative, it actually means relieving pain without dealing with the, with the cause of the condition. So how the hell is our whole health care system palliative, right? Like someone comes in, oh, my knees are killing me. Okay, well, put these pills in your mouth. Um, you know, you're running and it's making it worse. Okay, don't run. Like we're not even touching on, on the fact that, okay, your movement is off. Your movement is poor. You're using your knees to do what your hips should be doing. Let's fix the damn hips, right? Like what are, what are key, um, you know, probably assumptions that you can make? You can probably assume, and, and I, I think it's rarely proven wrong. You probably assume that most people are sitting way too much. Most people are wearing shitty footwear all day. So why don't we take I, I a look at those? Another thing too, it just we just need to prioritize the, the f- some baseline level of, of physical culture that needs t- to happen with people. Yeah. And, and that needs to be just as, it's almost like physical culture is this like, side thing that people do who are like fit or or whatever but it's like hey we're we're human we're human animals and we need a big part of our health as as much as you don't may not like to to believe it is just getting to know your body using your body mm-hmm. doing different things with your body keeping the joints moving well and a, and a big part of that is just specifically learning how to keep keep the joints moving well um, mobilize your joints when needed just just learning about how the parts work and move if you want to continue to use your body even at a basic level because it's a basic, you don't have to go that deep to just understand okay i gotta move my hip is a ball and socket i gotta move the ball and socket on a daily basis or else the ball and socket gets stiff not rocket science i think that goes all the way back to like education and what we learn coming up through it's like it's almost like we're being trained from from day one to sit in chairs and we are it's like you you reach grade one kids have desk jobs all day yeah so you start by sitting and you think that's normal and then you get scolded for not sitting but then no one ever tells you along the way the the physical consequences of sitting yeah other uh, there's mental consequences too but the the physical consequences of sitting are, are really wreaking havoc on our musculoskeletal systems um for one and we're not, no one know. everyone just thinks it's normal from day one. And then it's creating this culture where we're just less and less attuned with our bodies. Mm. And I think, I think that's some of the deeper levels of what needs to happen is just like it to be ingrained in our educational system to some extent. We do phys ed, but it's all, it's usually just, you know, playing around. Half the kids get hurt when they're doing phys ed. Yeah, it's like, throw a dodgeball at these kids, stay busy. <laughs> like, exactly. That's a perfect environment to teach kids basic maintenance. And I, and I think, you know, if you think about what we learn in physio school, uh, what we hear about uh, the, what what medical doctors learn in their school, you completely understand why we're so off pace. Mm-hmm. And, and you also see cultures that have this physical culture, right? Like when we went to China, um, I remember we were walking down the street. You see people on a Saturday morning doing Tai Chi. You see people doing like group coordinated dances. Like these people have, there, there are places in the world that have a physical culture. And I think it's no surprise that those people also have a way lower incidence of musculoskeletal problems. They don't have as much back pain as us. They don't have as much knee pain as us. They age much more gracefully. They don't break down as quickly. And it's like, maybe we should learn from these cultures, right? Maybe it's not Tai Chi, but we need something. We need some sort of movement environment. And, and we need to get adults to understand that when you're a kid, you play, you move around. When you're an adult, it's like you get confined to the, the you get confined to a, a chair and you think that problems are just normal that come up because you're getting older. Oh, I'm 40, so I'm going to have more knee problems. Oh, I'm 50, I'm having back pain. It's like, no, you're supposed to move well. Just keep fucking moving. Exactly. Like it's, just, it's so frustrating because it really is, you know, in our sport med docs are almost outliers because instead of saying, oh, you have knee-itis, you have this itis or osis, they're, they're saying you need to move more. You need to understand the fundamentals of movement. You need to make sure your joints work like you're supposed to, and then you have to use them every day. And people almost look at them weird. When it's like, that's I got to do that? It's yeah. like, yeah, you, you do. It, yeah. It's what you, like, you can't, there's no like, simple can't you just solution. Inject, can you just inject this joint, make it feel better? It's like, well, I can, and that's probably what you're going to get in most places, but it's not going to solve the problem. It's weird. It's like, it's like, hey, I, you buy a car. Okay, I want I want this car to last 20 years. I want to make sure this is on the road. It's a big investment, my most important investment, right? Um okay, so if you want to last 20 years, but then you never do the work to maintain it, you abuse it, you drive it like shit, you you let it pile up with garbage. It's like, okay, well, that car that you you said was the most important investment is not going to last you 20 years. You're going to have to get a new one. You're going to have to get parts replaced way sooner because you're not doing the groundwork. Mm -hmm. If it truly is the most important investment, 
which I think your body is your, your truly your most important investment that you should have mm -hmm. because your body is the thing that allows you to do stuff. It, like your body, literally, you're not gonna be able to do the things you're not gonna be able to live like you want to live if you don't have your body or with you. So again, you need to do the work. You just, there's some ex sort of work that you need to do. And I think people need to know that too. For sure. And I think like even in back to the school and, and job, I think there's certain companies these days that are starting to see the benefit of like, and it's almost coming from like a selfish point of view. It's like, hey, if we let our employees like move a little bit more, um, or if we bring in like a yoga teacher, They're you know, once productive. a week, hey, they actually get more productive. Like this is good for us too. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yes, it is. It's good for everybody. It's good for morale. It's good for the individual who's doing it. It's also good for the the company. It's good for the culture. Um, hey, school children, same thing. Hey, if we let them move a little bit more, maybe they'll be, there's an example in that book, Spark. You let kids, um, they, they specifically put in physical activity. Like that was this, um, this school board in, I don't know where, somewhere in the States. Um, and they implemented these physical activity specifically during the day, at times in the day, um, right before class. And, and the kids were just like that much more engaged, engaged they tested and higher. they're tested higher. Yeah. They, their math scores were outliers. They they were basically, I think they were second in math and first in science in the world when they tested that school board versus yeah. every other country. Whereas and they this, were like last before that. They were well, terrible the, before Well, that. the rest of the states was like 25th or, or 30th or whatever that was. But yeah. um, And all they did in the school was prioritize that physical, uh, physical culture, basically, and movement. So... Anyways, I think that going down that road needs to be discussed because that's it's like why are people thinking it's so normal to be to be stiff and then they're almost like shocked when you tell them, "Oh, I you know, you need to do some work to just get everything moving. Mm -hmm. We need to address the root cause." But truly that is the root cause. Um and we're talking about getting back to hips. It's like hips are the root cause of a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about the flat flat feet and everything like that. That's one of the byproducts of hips just not participating and doing what they're supposed to be doing so, so we talk about like one of the things that we show people that come in and say oh i got flat feet they're genetic i've had them forever is that kind of little party trick to demonstrate that you can control your arch by getting them to go uh, hip width apart feet straight knees slightly bent you push the knees out to the side without letting your feet come off the ground and it magically brings the arch of your foot up and then people are like okay well what am i doing there well you're consciously creating torque at your hip it's aligning all of your lower leg bones aligning your femur your tibia all the way down to your foot and it's putting your foot in this better position so you have people have to do that consciously and for a lot of people it's actually a battle to do that they have to really work because they're almost working against the tension that's causing your hips to fall into the position that they are that they're in when they're sitting so and the other one is just standing up straight same position feet yeah. side by side and and trying to stand up tall and squeezing your butt yeah. and what you'll feel is the floor almost getting pushed apart mm -hmm. by your feet so it's like your feet are going to a bit of abduction external rotation there just by squeezing your butt right and that that's it's just something that shows people that oh i'm in control of this my feet aren't just flat mm -hmm. um your, your hips are doing that both those uh both those things were both your hips influence on what your feet are doing at the ground yeah and it's so, so then it's and that it almost brings it to like the whole like um weak glute myth yeah that pisses me off so much because i think it's a couple different parts okay glute amnesia is a real thing people lose touch with being able to use their asses use their glutes but it's not that they're weak right you can't bridge your way out of a, a fundamental lack of hip extension right if you spend all day it's, in a flex position you can't do bridges and expect to magically regain that that, that range i think we should say it's not that they're they may be weak, but it's not, it's not that they don't work. It's not, not that they're they not can't. firing. It's not that they're not firing because you always hear that thrown around like your glutes aren't firing. You're, yeah. um, now, they're just I'm not like, firing in the, in the it, like Greg Cook said it really yeah. well. It's your glutes are firing. They're just not firing in the key patterns that they need, that they're they, required exactly. for. They're um, not firing in the positions or patterns that where you have, where you actually need them, yeah. right? And that's, that's what we got to look at. Are they actually able to fire in the positions where you actually need your glutes to fire? Yeah. Because you could, you could, you know, poke somebody's butt and say, hey, fire your glute, like just laying down. It's like, okay, great. Yeah, you can fire your glute. It, it, it works. It's not like your your glute's dead or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but really, and again, I think strength is a big component of that, but you can't strengthen something that you can't access in positions or, mm -hmm. or, or patterns that you, that you require. There you go. So positional inhibition, the inability to extend your hip is by default going to mean you're not going to be able to access to the full extent the ability to fire your glutes right exactly. they're still going to be able to fire there's your brain is talking to them it's just not telling them to fire in the right positions because you can't even achieve hip extension exactly so step one is get the joint moving like fix your hardware and then layer on new software that's kind of this um like 
paradigm that we often preach is, okay, get the joint moving, get the articular prerequisite, get the joint moving like it's supposed to reclaim your ability to go in hip extension by working on your hip extension every day, offsetting the sitting you do, but also working to just reclaim what normal hip extension should be. Then you can start to reteach your brain how to use the glutes in hip extension. Exactly. With, you know, even a fundamental uh, movement like walking can be an extremely powerful hip extension mobilization and rewiring pattern by just understanding how to actually use like how to actually use that hip extension well it's like if you if you compare it to let's say the the elbow um and the tricep so let's say you're doing like a classic tricep pull down but you're you're missing your ability to extend your elbow mm -hmm. let's say you're missing the last your elbow's locked up you can't extend it within 20 degrees of where it should be mm -hmm. like even trying it right now you can't lock in the tricep the way it should be locked in to try to do that mm -hmm. right yeah or, if you spent two months in a cast with your arm bent to 90 degrees and you couldn't get beyond 90 degrees of elbow extension, it doesn't matter. You can work in that inner range all you want, but it's exactly. not very useful. So you, if one side, you're trying to do tricep extension, one side is extending fully, and you're able to really lock it out at that end range of the joint and squeeze that tricep. The other side, you're missing 20 degrees. You're definitely not, you're, the tricep still works. That's just like the glute. It's still working, but you're not able to fully access the, the motion and especially access it in the position you're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. You can tell the fire all day, but you're not going to be able to, if your elbow joint doesn't actually move, you're not going to be able to fully access that, mm -hmm. that contraction of the tricep at end range to lock out your elbow joint. And let's so, talk about the byproducts of that. So in terms of the hip, if you can't extend your hip and use your glute to really achieve a good, powerful contraction, then your calf has to work a lot harder to try and do some of to give you. If some we're, talking of that walking, if we're talking about walking, we're talking about walking. Yeah, um, or even running. You know, your calf has to do a lot more. So if you got perpetually tight ankles, doesn't matter how much you mobilize your ankle, it's always tight. Maybe your hip can't extend, so your calf is doing a lot of that work and getting overused to do a job it's not supposed to. Maybe that's creating that perma tension that's there. So if you look at like. I guess you could say that if if the hips are not doing the job, then the joints downstream of them are having to take up slack. Or the muscle, yeah, the muscles downstream. Well, the, the, it's fundamentally the joints because, like, if your if your hip can't produce extension, your knee, and then the muscles around the knee have mm -hmm. to. So, like in that yeah. case, the the hamstring. But your knee is having to work harder, um, and then your ankle is having to work harder. So, like fundamentally, like it would be the the calf mm -hmm. for for the most part. But uh, there's other muscles that would play the part in that propulsion. But like those two other joints, you're, you're taking a knee strategy and an ankle strategy to something that the glute, um, sorry, or that the hip should be participating in. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's not that those like things are not, um, it's not that those body parts aren't important in the gait pattern. If we look at that, like your ankle, you need to be exposing to dorsiflexion. Your knee should be going into a fairly extended position as you push up. It's the interplay of all those joints. But if, again, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're taking one big joint out of it, those other two joints downstream are just going to have to do pick up the slack mm -hmm. and the muscles around them are just gonna have to do more work right mm -hmm. so yeah it's just it's just one of those things the 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 hips just create this spiral down effect of everything below them in the case of the lower body um having to work harder and you could talk about the upper body too it makes it makes up upstream things like your low back have to work harder as well mm -hmm. um so it's like that linchpin area so if we look at okay my hips don't move. i sit all day my hips don't move. I'm having problems with my knees, my back. I got flat feet, all this kind of stuff. Okay, where do I go from here? So number one, you know, in clinic, when we get that patient X in, that's exactly that. They sit all day. They got super tight hips. They got no hip mobility. Where do they start? Number one, let's talk about modifying your day-to-day -day position. So if you have to sit in meetings, you have to sit in your car to drive to work, um, that non-optional sitting, how do you offset the sitting that you're forced to do? And one of the things that we talk about is, for every hour you spend sitting in the chair position, you should probably be doing about a minute worth of hip mobility to regain that extension. And we have yeah. that exercise. If you go to tfcshop.com under the video section, one of them is the kneeling hip stretch. That's kind of our favorite until we're shown something that we see is more effective. Um, spending a minute oscillating in and out of hip extension for every hour you spend sitting. The second part is how do you modify and reduce the amount of sitting you do? So the idea is, okay, you can offset the sitting with a minute of hip extension mobility but how do you try and reduce the amount of that you have to do each day? And you do that by modifying your positions. Use a sit to stand workstation, spend more time standing. Exactly. Um, in modify your positions. environment. Right? Instead of sitting on the couch at the end of the day, watch an hour on Netflix, sit on the floor, go into 90 90, do your hip extension work. You know, try and reduce the workload of how much you have to offset your sitting by just 
and it doesn't have to be overnight, but just slowly reduce the amount of time you're spending in a chair and increase the amount of time you're exposing your hips to, um, you know, your current limits, go to your limits of hip extension, hip flexion, hip rotation um, on a regular basis. And that's, that's a pretty damn good start. And I think turning it in, instead of turn it into like homework they have to do. Mm -hmm. I think that it should just be something like, I don't think of when I do mobility work now, I, I don't think of it as like mobility work or homework that I'm doing. It's just that like, it's like, I'll be watching a documentary or something. I'll be watching whatever. And I'm just, I'm rocking into the, that frog position. I'm doing a 90, 90. I'm just, I'm just moving randomly. I'm exposing myself to different positions. Mm -hmm. I'm not even, I'm no longer thinking about it getting to the point where you don't even have to think about what you're doing you're kind of just putting your body in different positions you're you're essentially going into some form of play and if you want to look at like some of the best watch a watch a kid like a young kid play with toys with with their friends and you will see the the most dynamic hip mobility routine there is true watch that just watch it and you will see them like in the in the split straddling uh in a squat um They'll, they'll just be getting into these weird hip positions and they're literally just like throwing blocks around or playing with with toys and yep. it's like okay well that that's great like that is the the ideal hip mobility mm -hmm. um, you know routine right there is not even having to think about it just putting your body in all these positions because you want to actually get it there yeah just explore what your range is and and it's not you're right like we have to almost have this unstructured approach where people are just discovering like reconnect and discover with with what your body's supposed to be able to do exactly um, and and it's that's the best you know okay it's all good to say let's mobilize your hips but then the other big part that we talked about is you gotta actually move that so open up your hips but then just like you said use that range of motion use that extra maybe 10 degrees of hip extension to go out for a walk and and use that extension repattern mm -hmm. your glutes being able to fire in that new extension right it's exactly. using it that makes it so that you don't just lose it right away so i think it needs to i mean it for, mo for a lot of people it needs to be guided at first because just to show them what you know, ha some solid techniques that they can mobilize their hips in. But the more it becomes, the more they go with it, the more it can start to become unstructured. Mm -hmm. I think at first structure is key. Yeah. I agree. Um, and and don't explanation. Know what to do. Yeah. And then, but that comes back to the physical culture. The more you do this stuff, you're like, oh, cool. Cause I love when people come back to me and they're like, I found that when I did it like this way, I felt, you know, a bigger stretch or I, I felt it better when I got, I was like, that's great. You're learning from using your body. Mm -hmm. And when patients come back and tell me stuff like that, or, or, uh, you know, sometimes they'll say, I found when I did this one before that one, it made that one easier. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, great. You're learning. Right. And, and that just turns it into this, something that they're, they're exploring their body. Yeah. Um, and then the more they do that, the more it just becomes ingrained. It, it's just something that they do. And then the intrinsic reward, it's all, it's like anything in life. Like, the start of something is all it's always the hardest to get that momentum going yeah but once you start getting it going it's intrinsically rewarding to be able to i mean it, it's like eating well it's like anything else it's like oh once you start to feel the effects of it you start to feel better you can do more things mm -hmm. your pain starts diminishing well that's a big uh, thing it's like moving better pain going away or diminishing is a byproduct of improving your movement if yes. you only focus on the pain it doesn't do anything to the movement if you work on the movement Pain going away is what naturally happens when you move better. And I find um, actually, you're right. And I find it's like even pain, if you focus on the pain, it actually decreases your movement. It increases mm -hmm. more of that, that guarding, yep. um, the fear of movement, the inability to move or the perceived inability to move. Mm -hmm. the, some of the most immobile people have been people who have sustained an injury and they'll come to you a few months later and literally have not moved their arm or their leg from that position or have been like limping on that leg for no good reason. Yep. Um, only to find themselves super stuck and, and and even that much more immobile on that all due to that pain pattern and perception of pain. Mm -hmm. So again, people need to be guided, but um, you're right. Getting to the root cause is addressing their mobility issues and, and getting them to actually use these, uh, these joints through, you know, foundational movements that we, we need to do each day. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know if your hips are stiff, I would say if you consume more than four hours a day or even more than two hours a day on average sitting in a chair and you're not doing anything to actively offset it your hips are tight mm -hmm. so work on it the hip extension mobilization put yourself if you youtube 90 90 hip position um that's a great one to assess both your hips one an external run and internal rotation and just see how comfortable are you there do you feel really sketchy do you feel like your hips are going to explode do you have to put your hand down you know i think those are easy tests um 
to be able to see, you know, how locked up are your hips? You want to you know a master screen for the hips? Can you go down into a squat position and sit there comfortably for, for five minutes at least? You know, without your heels coming up, without your feet rotating out, um, without feeling like you're going to fall back on your ass. So, I mean, that's a, the squat is just this beautiful master screen. It doesn't, you know, not being able to squat doesn't necessarily mean your hips are the only culprit at play, but they're usually a big part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people spend all day, we talk about people spending time in hip flexion, so they lose extension. But I would argue that, I would almost put an asterisk beside that and say hip flexion to 90 degrees. Exactly. It almost seems like people when are they shitty go below about 90, that. shit falls apart because they're never usually there. Yeah, uh, people's hip flexion, you're right. It's 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 crazy. We would assume that though, just because you're in hip flexion, you're going to be good at it. But a lot of people have very weak hip flexors mm -hmm. and you try to put them above that 90 degree position and they just they just burn out back to that 90 degree position. Again, it's like that the muscle is just in that neutral range of hip mm -hmm. flexion. So that, that matters a lot. Like you go out for a hike, some of the best ways to expose your hips like when we go out uh, to Luskville getting your hip up onto these rocks in different positions and the, yeah. this is not possible if you don't have a really good amount of hip flexion as well exactly. hip flexion combined with rotation again all the combination of these planes but um it, it's all it's all important if you if you want to run well you better have a good amount of hip flexion too yep so it's important it shows up so i think uh we'll wrap it up with that but and we might even do a part two we'll kind of check out when this podcast does air we'll check out some of the comments we can always do a part two about the hips and address some questions that people have eventually a goal of ours is to have much more videos posted so that we can refer to certain videos on the site so that if you need um if you need some ideas in terms of what mobilizations you can do or have some guidance on that uh, we'll eventually have that set up in place but hopefully today's conversation gives you a different kind of look at um you know the hips being a big contributor to lower body problems, whether it's flat feet, knee problems, low back pain. Um, the hips really, from what we see in clinic and from what we see um, in almost everyone that we talk to at seminars or, um, or patients of ours is, the hips get stiff, so everything has to compensate downstream. And that can be anything from really tight ankles, flat feet, um, painful knees, super tight quads, like all these things come into it. And if you're doing activity on top of your day-to-day -day routine, like running or sprinting or playing hockey or whatever it is, establishing, re-establishing and restoring hip mobility and function in the muscles that cross the hip is even more important. Exactly. It's like so, get them moving and then and then you add them into your, get them involved in the movement patterns that you're going to be doing anyways, right? Yeah. And once you establish the mobility, use it every damn day and you won't mysteriously lose it and you'll just keep progressing more and more and more. So get your hips working. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in.